With neurogenic bladder, neurogenic means arising from the nervous system. So neurogenic bladders typically some difficulty emptying the bladder normally, as a result of either damage to the peripheral nerves, brain, or spinal cord. Normally, urine is held in the bladder, which receives urine from two ureters coming down from the kidneys, and then that urine leaves the bladder through the urethra. As urine flows from the kidney through the ureters and into the bladder, the bladder starts to expand into the abdomen. The bladder is able to expand and contract because it's wrapped in a muscular layer, called the detrusor muscle, and within that, lining the bladder itself, is a layer of transitional epithelium containing umbrella cells. These umbrella cells get their name because they physically stretch out as the bladder fills, just like an umbrella opening in slow motion. In a grown adult, the bladder can expand to hold about 750 milliliters, slightly less in women than in men, because the uterus takes up space, which crowds out the bladder a little bit. Enjoying our osmosis videos? Unlock your full potential with an osmosis subscription. Get unlimited access to every Osmosis feature and resource with a free seven-day trial. All right, so when the urine's collecting in the bladder, there are basically two doors that are shut, which holds the urine in. The first door is the internal sphincter muscle, which is made of smooth muscle and is under involuntary control, meaning that it opens and closes automatically. Typically, that internal sphincter muscle opens up when the bladder is about half full. The second door is the external sphincter muscle, and it's made of skeletal muscles and is under voluntary control, meaning that it opens and closes when a person wants it to. This is the reason that it's possible to stop urine midstream by tightening up that muscle, which is called doing Kegel exercises. Once urine has passed through the external sphincter muscle, it exits the body. In women, the exit's immediate, and in men, the urine flows through the penis before it exits. So when specialized nerves called stretch receptors in the bladder wall sense that the bladder is about half full, they send impulses to the spinal cord, specifically the sacral spinal cord at levels S2 and S3, known as the micturition center, and the brain, specifically two locations in the pons, the pontine storage center and the pontine micturition center. The spinal cord response is part of the micturition reflex, and it causes an increase in parasympathetic stimulation and decrease in sympathetic stimulation, which makes the detrusor muscle contract and the internal sphincter relax. It also decreases motor nerve stimulation to the external sphincter, allowing it to relax as well. At this point, urination would happen, if not for the pons. The pons is the region of the brain that we train to voluntarily control urination. If we want to delay urination, or hold it in, the pontine storage center overrides the micturition reflex. And when we want to urinate, the pontine micturition center allows for the micturition reflex to happen. Now, with neurogenic bladder, the exact pattern of symptoms depends on the nerve that's damaged. In diabetes mellitus, Excess glucose levels in the blood attaches to various proteins, a process called glycation. This process can damage sensory nerve fibers in the bladder wall, in the pelvic nerve, or in dorsal nerve roots entering the spinal cord, all of which interferes with the initial stretch signal that gets sent out as the bladder fills. Another potential cause is syphilis. This infection can eventually lead to tabes dorsalis, which is inflammation and scarring of those same little dorsal root nerves. Also, with herpes, the virus takes up a home in the dorsal nerve roots for months to years, and it can also disrupt the sensory fibers that they carry within them. This all means that as the bladder fills to capacity and stretches, that sensory information is not received, and the bladder starts to overflow, drop by drop, out of the urethra. This is called overflow incontinence. Now, that sensory information goes through the micturition center at the S2, S3 region of the spinal cord. So if there's an injury to the spinal cord in that region, for example, if someone falls from a tree or a ladder and lands on their buttocks, then again, that micturition reflex pathway is interrupted and someone can have overflow incontinence. 
Now, if there's a spinal cord injury above the sacral region, then immediately after, all the reflexes below the injury are suppressed. This phenomenon is known as spinal shock and can last hours to weeks. The exact mechanism behind spinal shock, though, isn't completely clear. But during spinal shock, the micturition reflex gets suppressed as well, and it leads to detrusor hyporeflexia, which once again leads to overflow incontinence. Now, once that shock wears off, normal micturition reflex resumes, since the sacral region's intact. But the signals can't be sent to or received from the pons, which means that there's no inhibitory pathway from the brain. So this means that the bladder goes into overdrive mode, leading to detrusor hyperreflexia. At this point, even a tiny amount of urine initiates the micturition reflex, which leads to frequent urges to urinate, called urge incontinence. Now, in multiple sclerosis, a similar pattern unfolds, except in this case the body's immune system attacks the myelin sheath of the nerves in the brain and spinal cord. Once again, though, this can prevent the inhibitory signals from the brain from reaching the micturition reflex pathway, which causes detrusor hyperreflexia and urge incontinence. Going a little further up, if there are acute injuries to the brain, like a stroke, then there'll be a similar pattern as spinal injuries, with an initial shock phase of detrusor hyporeflexia, as well as overflow incontinence, followed by detrusor hyperreflexia and urge incontinence. In chronic processes, like a brain tumor or Parkinson's disease, there's usually no state of shock, and instead it typically proceeds directly to detrusor hyperreflexia as well as urge incontinence. Diagnosis can be done by measuring post-void residuals, which is the amount of urine left in the bladder after urination, as well as the pressure and flow of the urine. Treatment of overflow incontinence can be relieved by putting a catheter through the urethra that drains the urine. Urge incontinence can be relieved with anticholinergic drugs that help relax the detrusor muscle. Alright, as a quick recap. Neurogenic bladders where some form of nerve damage causes bladder dysfunction. And this dysfunction could be overflow incontinence where the bladder fills up to capacity and then dribbles out of the urethra or urge incontinence, where an individual feels frequent urges to urinate. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.